All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank y'all for being here. Um, did anyone sign up to speak? Oh, sorry. I just have one job, just one job. Press the button. Okay. Okay, here we go. So good afternoon again, everybody. It is just a little after two on um, February 4th, Thursday. Did anyone sign up to uh, speak at the this workshop? Okay, very good. Then let's move on to uh, the first item on the work session agenda, which is to discuss as maybe needed any regular meeting agenda items that are posted to tonight's regular meeting. Council or staff, is there anything that anyone wants to cover or discuss fully? Mayor, I might just note that if it's not actually on your agenda, but just um, it would have been uh, except that the tax credit developer we visited this last work session has pulled his application, so that um, isn't on the agenda at all. Thank you. Everybody understand the fact that matters on the agenda. <laughs> You can't force it. I know. Sorry. Next is uh, item number two is to discuss the process for conducting performance evaluations for city council appointed uh, employees. Um, as I have said before, um, I think that we as a council need to, uh, that we owe it to the appointees to revamp our evaluation process and to um, and to have a good written set in stone um, process that we agree upon. And, um, and we're not equipped to do that. So um, what Ms. Myers and I have talked about is uh, possibly teaming up with SGR. Everyone here is familiar with SGR and their relationship with us, and especially with our um, executive level employees. So what we have today is I believe we have Mike on the line with SCR. Mike, are you there and can you hear us? I'm just a second. Not yet. So um, I can hear you. Hello, Mr. Mayor and Council. Good. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. So, Council, um, Mike presented a or, or sent over a proposal to Ms. Myers and I, sort of outlining um, the uh, obviously the, the price of walking us through this evaluation and then obviously what we would then get for that price and we've asked Mike to join us today to uh, to sort of go over that evaluation process. So Mike, you're up. Okay, thank you, Mayor, and greetings, everyone. I wish I could be there in person with you, but hopefully this will suffice. And uh, yes, as the Mayor said, this is one of the things we provide is a facilitated discussion with uh, council appointed employees so that it is both uh, fair to the employee and productive for future growth and is uh, balanced so that all of the council can give input and um, do that in a way that is both uh, expressive but also uh, productive. So the way we uh, propose doing this is for each of the unique positions, which in your case in this proposal, we've considered city manager, city attorney, city clerk, city judge, and the chief financial officer. We have a different evaluation form for each one of those. They're similar, but they're a little bit unique to each position. Obviously, the way you evaluate a city manager is going to be different than the way the evaluation is for the city judge and so forth. And the way this process will work is that the SGR uh, person, the, the, the contractor that we'll work with, will provide to you and, and to everyone on the council a copy of an evaluation form that allows you to make input on the main items that you're concerned about that uh, have to do with the, the, locate, the, the running of this particular position. And the responses then will be sent back to uh, SGR. And they run from everything taking the city manager as the template, because that's the one maybe that usually has the most interest. The categories are leadership management, 
planning under that would be planning, organizing, supervision, delegation, timing, uh, communication with the governing body, communication with the public, with employees, and then um, are they creative? Are they honest? Are they fair? Various categories like that. I, I won't go into all of them. And then for each of the areas of service for a municipality, each council person gets to say, has this area uh, declined? Has there been no change or has it improved? And uh, you get to go through and make all of those, those um, comments and then a place where you can, let, you can uh, you know, write in comments of strengths, areas that you think uh, need to be considered for growth. Those are resubmitted to or submitted back to SGR via um, electronically. And then each person's responses are color coded. So it, it's not possible for somebody to say to the mayor, for example, hey, tell the city manager, I don't like the way they do this, but don't tell them it was me that said it. Because that's not, a, that's not authentic, that's not transparent. And it really is not helpful because that person can't tell, well, what, what's, what's up with this? So they're color coded so that your responses are, uh, you know, your responses. And then they, the um, evaluation tool is made a composite. The employee gets a copy of it and uh, knows it in advance. And then when the um, facilitator from SGR meets with the council and that employee, uh, he or she will facilitate that discussion so that uh, if there's any area where the composite score was uh, below average, then they have to make a response to that. They can make a response if they so choose to any of the areas, but if there's an area that's below grade, they have to respond to that. And we will facilitate that dialogue so that um, it can be productive and helpful. And uh, then essentially it becomes the, um, the foundation, I would say, for um, you know, growth, professional development and growth for that employee in the coming year. And I do think that it builds on itself year by year and is something that provides a, a standardized evaluation and one that everyone, even if you're new on the council, you can enter into and you have your opportunity to give your feedback. So that, that's really what we're interested in is opportunity for everyone to give input, to be it fair and to facilitate a discussion that is positive and focuses on future growth. So let me stop with that and see if you have questions that I can help answer and talk about regarding the instrument or the process. How long does a process like this normally take? Right? Well, you know, I work with a lot of councils and I found that uh, they take the time that you give them to do it. But I think, you know, a legitimate time to about to complete that evaluation is probably two weeks to three weeks, depending upon what your workload is and, you know, kind of what you say as a city. And then I think the, the discussion, you know, probably with most employees is, is an hour, you know, in length. I think that maybe if the uh, city manager might be a little bit longer than that, depending upon you know, how things go. But I think this, you know, when you're talking about five employees, I think it is, you know, that can be done in, you know, two half days, probably something like that. Not saying we would need two full half days, but I don't know if it's really the best use of your time to say we would do that all in one day, because I would think that might wear you out, but we could do according to your needs. Thank you. Mike, was there a, um, uh, a like a, a council training session or a, I don't even know if training is the right word, but is, is there a time that, that SGR would get together with council to uh, sort of go over almost like in a tutorial type setting of, of what we can expect throughout this process or do the evaluation form simply show up in our email and we get started? Oh, that, that's a great question. And we can, we, we normally do it by phone. 
one by one. So okay. usually that, that facilitator will contact each person on the council after they get the, the forms, you'll know that they're coming and they'll talk, you'll set up a time through email to have a conversation as sort of a tutorial to walk them through, okay, here's how you're going to fill it out and what it means and answer any questions they have about it. We could do it. We certainly could do it in a you know Zoom call kind of setting. If you preferred, we, we would just work with you according to your, your preference on that. So you say there's a two to three week process. What we've done historically is, um, is over a two or three day period, we've had uh, the, um, the appointees come in and basically give us their work plan. So that, that's really kind of been the extent of an evaluation. We called it an evaluation, but it, it wasn't really. I mean, it was basically them presenting what their plans were for the coming year. Um, so whenever you say a, a two to three week process, do you mean a two to three week process to be able to work through all five appointees? Yeah, yes. So we would give you the form uh, in advance because you have to complete it in advance and send it back to us and by a certain date so that we can make a composite and send it to you, send it to the employee so they can see in advance. You don't really want them to see that as they're just walking in. It will be very difficult to have a, a real good discussion about it. So that, that just the give and take of really council having time to complete it and making sure our facilitator has a day or two to complete it. And then, um, you know, you, you sort of set it, you work from the, the back, you know, from the end point backwards. So you say, if we're gonna have our discussion, our facilitated discussion on this date, then that means that everyone has to have their forms completed by this date, which means we have to give them to you by this date. And we have to have you know, that tutorial call, whether it's a Zoom call with everybody or one-on-one or -on -one by a certain date. So that's how, that's why I say it takes a two or three week period. The discussion itself is just, you know, you're, you're taking an hour probably to complete the forms all together for five employees. And you're taking an hour to have the discussion with most employees, maybe two hours with city manager. Council, any other thoughts? Questions for Mr. Mallory? Mm -hmm. I bet we'll have some after we start. All right. And I'll, uh, I'll get the, the proposal um, through Janet out to everybody tomorrow so y'all can think through that. It, it basically is a synopsis of what you just said, but to me, I like to see it in writing. So, anything else? Mr. Mallory, thank you for taking a little bit of time with us today, and um, we'll discuss and be back in touch. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Council. All the best to you. Yeah, have a good day. Bye-bye. All right. Moving on to item number three is to receive a presentation on the regional transit study. Helen, is Nancy Edgerton on the call? She's logging in right now. I'll let her in when she's <clears throat> Well, she's logging in and getting set up. I'll make a few introductory comments if that's okay here. So, um, so Mayor and Council, you will uh, likely recall that we, uh, several months ago, we entered into a contract with Ms. Edmondson um, to evaluate our transit um, governance structure. Um, as well as a <coughs> local agreement with the uh, four other cities that are currently served by the Hill Country Transit District and eight of the nine counties that are currently served by the Hill Country Transit District. Um, the, um, the genesis, I guess, if you will, of the study was um, some concerns that uh, most cities, most city management uh, teams uh, across the, the uh, five cities that are served by um, the current Hill Country Transit District have uh, had regarding the, um, the management of the district. And um, as council may recall about seven or eight years ago, um, the state of Texas uh, changed um, 
the way that they were administering Medicaid funds. Um, and that uh, change had an adverse impact on the financial structure of the Hill Country Transit District. Um, but the management team at that time didn't make any adjustments or uh, pivot in any way um, for several years, um, at, at which time it kind of got to a crisis level. They had been using fund balance um, to try to make up that difference. And then that was no longer an option. And so kind of at the 11th hour, they came back to the cities um, with some pretty substantial um, increased requests for local cost participation. Um, that, that I think that's the point where we, we really um, started having some of these conversations about if the current um, structure was the right structure to continue um, to provide the service that uh, we want to see um, for transit, um, uh, transit delivery in our area. Um, so I began to research um, uh, people, uh, consulting firms or consulting groups that had a particular um, expertise in transit because it is a complicated subject when you start talking about governance and, and financial, um, how, how all of the financial pieces work. Um, we formed a, a, a group again with, with some of the other uh, city managers and, and county judges and interviewed a few firms. We decided that Nancy um, had the right expertise to, to uh, get us uh, to uh, a point where we could start answering some of the questions that we have. Um, and she is um, substantially complete with her study right now. There's one remaining um, task and that's an implementation plan. Um, so she'll walk you through um, the work that she's done to date. Um, I wanted you all to get an opportunity to hear from her. She's very knowledgeable and I think you'll, uh, the presentation will be helpful and enlightening to you. Um, and uh, just a few things to remember as we uh, let her kick off is this was, this, this is probably one of the, this is probably the first step in a series of steps that we may wanna take um, to enhance our transit um, service and the way we deliver that. And so this study's focus was simply on the governance model. How, how do we govern transit delivery? It, it's not a route study. It's not a financial analysis study. It's really just talking about, it's not an operational study. It's really just talking about whether our current governance structure as a large region is the right structure um, to continue to meet the needs or further meet the needs that we have in transit. And as you listen to Nancy's presentation today, keep in mind that the feedback that I'm gonna ask you for at the end of the presentation isn't to make a final decision or any kind of decision at all about what we will ultimately do in terms of structuring the governance of transit. It's simply, uh, I'm simply looking for feedback from you on which of the four options you would uh, like to get more information about. Um, we have, uh, as part of the scope of work, um, in our contract with Nancy, she will be building out an implementation plan um, for one of the four options. As you'll hear her, her uh, talk about, one of the options is uh, what I consider status quo, is to stay with the Hill Country Transit District as it is currently um, organized. And so we don't really need an implementation plan for that option uh, because we are already doing that. So really listen in as you listen to, to Nancy and think about whether option two, three, or four as a contrast to option one would be what we would want to get some more information on. Um, again, I, I can't stress enough that you're not, you're not needing to make a decision about the future today, just what options we want to consider further, if any. Has there been any discussion yet of these options amongst other councils? Yes, did, sir. Did you say you were listening I, in on some of I did. I attended a lot of city council meetings this week. <laughs> um, actually, a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, um, Nancy gave uh, the same presentation you'll receive today to the Bell County Commissioner's Court. Um, and then Tuesday, she presented um, to the city council of Harker Heights and the city council of Coppers Cove. She has made the offer to present to all of the participating cities and counties um, as far as I know, 
Um, the four of us are the only ones so far that have taken her up on that offer. So we're still um, reaching out and trying to coordinate uh, or, or provoke, I guess, an interest from, um, from some of the other governing bodies. Um, we've had a staff, uh, uh, well, staff from the um, cities and some elected officials from the county working group um, that has been meeting um, routinely throughout the process. Um, and so our last meeting, Nancy uh, presented us the report you'll get today, uh, specifically on the options, um, and asked us for feedback on um, with, before she went on with the very last task, which is the implementation plan. Um, she wants to make sure that that adds the most value to, um, to the group. So the one that is most likely going to be considered over again, that option one doesn't need an implementation plan. So the, the, the next most likely thing to be considered would obviously add the most value to us to have an implementation plan for that. So she generously offered to pause her work and let us have some conversations and some conversations among the different governing bodies. And then later this month, we'll reconvene that staff working group um, to uh, report back on the feedback we, we, we have received from our um, different governing bodies and um, with the goal of making the final selection, again, on the implementation plan, but not obviously not the final decision on what you ultimately get. So I hope that's clear. And with that, I will ask, um, unless you all have questions of me first, I will ask Nancy to um, get started. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody. Can y'all hear me? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Hopefully I'm not too technologically challenged to do it here. Okay, can y'all see that? Yes. Yep. Okay, and the first thing you can see is that I forgot to change the name on the bottom there, but fortunately, Brent already told you this was the same presentation given to the Bell County Commissioner's Court a couple of weeks ago. Um, hence the, the name there at the bottom. And then I did present to the other two small cities on Tuesday and got some good feedback from them as well. But I would love to talk to some of the other uh, participating parties, particularly the city of Colleen, who we have not yet, not yet heard from. Um, Brent also gave a great introduction in reminding us that this isn't a um, financing study and it isn't a route study. Some of the questions I got from the prior meetings often was be the people listening would immediately jump to what kind of routes that we have, or will this save us money? And those are all very good questions. But as Bryn said, the scope of the study was looking at governance, which certainly ultimately has an effect on your service and the financing. But I think the governance kind of has to come first. Um, and I'm glad y'all started out in that direction. So the purpose of the study was, is the current structure of the district meeting the needs of the communities it serves? And if not, what is the best structure for providing transit in the region? Um, it sounds like a fairly simple question, but it's one that's got a lot of different answers. If you look around the state of Texas, which is where, where we drew a lot of the examples from that we'll be talking about. I wanted to mention the tasks completed during the studies to let you know that there's a lot of work that's been done. There's a technical memorandum associated with each of, with each of these squares. So there's a whole lot of information for those of you all, you all who want to dig any deeper. I can certainly get you those technical memos. Um, but in the interest of time and trying to make something maybe a 20 to 30 minute presentation, I'm gonna be whipping through some of these tasks pretty quickly. Um, probably the big, the probably the longest of the technical memos is that first one, the review of existing conditions that it's assessing the trends, particularly the financial trends at Hill Country Transit over the last 10 years and studying how they allocate costs and labor across division and a number of other questions. It gives, it gives you very good background on, on how Hill Country Transit has evolved over the last 10 years or so. Um, the, the second task there was the stakeholder interviews. Uh, as a part of the project back in August and September, I talked to representatives of six of the counties, all five cities, the board, uh, and some 
people representing various economic interests and social services in the region to talk about the goals and the needs for transit in the region. It was actually very interesting and you get a summary in a minute, um, but it's, a, it's an interesting read in itself, just the summary of what the 15 different people had to say. We proceeded to a peer review, which compared Hill Country Transit to eight similar agencies in Texas, looking at efficiency and effectiveness. Um, profiled four areas in Texas into case studies, just to demonstrate in more detail, what are some of the different approaches to transit governance in Texas? And do any of those provide us with a model that we might want to um, look at? And in fact, we end up using two of those four as models for some of the alternatives that you'll see at the end. And then that led us to the assessment of the options. We developed four options for structuring transit service in the area. And it did a detailed assessment of the service, of how their impact would be on the service, the governance and the financial criteria that were laid out. Most of you are probably pretty familiar with Hill Country Transit, but I figured as I've talked to people the last few weeks, I'm never sure, so it was worth just doing a very quick overview. What you see in front of you are the nine counties that the district serves, um, and then the two separate urbanized areas, uh, the Colleen urbanized area and the Temple urbanized area. Those definitions of urbanized, matter, urbanized areas matters uh, for a federal transit administration funding who distributes monies to an urbanized area as a whole. But there's fixed route bus service and ADA complementary paratransit service in the two urbanized areas. There's demand response service, which is the prearranged door-to-door small bus type service for medical purposes only in rural Bell County. And then there's all purpose or meaning any type of trip demand response service in the remaining eight counties. And that's the service they've been providing um, gosh, for 20 years or more or so. I think that the fixed route service was started about 20 years ago. And before that, it was just rural demand response. Um, the summary, this again is, is information in some ways, I know you, you all know better than I do, but I was struck with the size, both in terms of population and uh, square miles of the uh, service area when I started working on this. The nine county region has almost or a little more than a half a million people today spread over 8,400 square miles. You know, it's just huge. You think about a half a million person city is a really different thing to think of maybe than what is really still a rural transit provider today. And the urban service and the urban riders account for the majority of the service. What's called their urban bell, urban FR, that's fixed route and the Bell Urban Demand Response, or DR, accounts for more than 80% of the ridership that Hill Country Transit carries today. And then the little green pie um, that's next to it is the other counties, and you can see how the breakout goes amongst the other counties. Uh, Milam County being the next largest and the others being fairly small after that. Um, in the... Uh, Existing conditions report, there's a lot of detail about the revenues and expenses, but I want to at least put up enough to give you a feel for the, the, the size that we're talking about, how it breaks out. You know, we're talking about a, you know, eight to nine million dollar a year operation. The bulk of the revenues come from the federal government through the Federal Transit Administration, followed by TxDOT which is not exclusively, but TxDOT focuses more on funding rural transportation than it does urban. The local governments are next, followed by fares. And then the other one, which actually isn't, the, which is actually the second largest is this Medicaid and AAA. AAA is very small. The Medicaid service is what Brim was referring to earlier, which is the monies that the agency earns by carrying Medicaid trips for the state of Texas's uh, Medicaid um, program. And somewhat oddly, even though that technically that's federal money, it can be used as match for federal transit administration grant monies. So it's very important to Hill Country Transit and a lot of transit, uh, rural transit agencies in Texas to carry this Medicaid service because they're earning local dollars that way or local match. And that's what's declined over the last 10 to 15 years as the state has changed how it um, configures that service 
And that's really very much what's created a lot of the funding crisis that Hill Country Transit's been facing the last few years. They just have not searched out or been creative in finding ways to, to replace those funds. Um, the operating cost by division, Colleen is the largest because it's got the most service at 44% of the operating costs. Uh, the Temple Belton uh, urbanized area about 26% and the rural is about 30% of the operating costs. So obviously the operating costs at 30% for rural is a good deal higher than the percentage of people that are carried in the rural area. It's about 16% of the riders. I wanted to mention this kind of special issue related to rural Bell County, um, just so you all were aware of it. Um, the uh, demand response trips for residents of rural Bell Bar rural Bell County are only allowed for medical purposes, not for all other purposes as in the other rural counties. But because rural Bell County accounts for about a quarter of the rural population of Hill Country Transit, um, it is in essence generating more revenues uh, than it is, um, than there is money being spent on service in the rural portion of Bell County. A lot of the, the, the state and federal grant monies are a portion to rural areas on formulas and one of the biggest components of the formula is population. So because rural Bell County has so many people, it's generating over $350,000 a year worth of, of um, federal grant, federal and state grant monies and the expenses for the service being provided in it is, is less than half of that. Mostly because th those people are restricted to only using it for medical trips. Uh, Brim was with a group that met with the uh, interim executive director of Hill Country Transit recently and asked why that was the case. And she really didn't have a very direct answer. Brim can address that a little more, but it just sounds like it's something that was established many years ago, not at a board level. And it's, it's pretty much stayed the same probably as much as anything because nobody was really focused on it. I'm not even sure if the folks in rural Bell County know that they're not getting the same service as the people, you know, in the next county over. Um, the stakeholder interviews, as I mentioned, were really quite interesting. Um, and there were some areas where everybody, there was a quite a bit of agreement and areas where there was quite a bit of disagreement. The primary area where the stakeholders tended to agree was that transit should be a regional thing, to facilitate transit across the region, not just say within an individual city or within an individual county. And then general, the stakeholders felt that public transit should serve all residents, not just seniors and other special groups. Some places, for example, just have senior disabled services, not general public. But in general, everybody felt it should be general public and it should be something that helps you move people around the greater region. From there, there wasn't a whole lot of agreement. The main place that people diverged are in the rural interests are largely happy with the current structure and the current services they receive, uh, which is mostly carrying senior citizens to uh, medical appointments, uh, nutrition, and uh, going to senior services centers and that sort of thing. They're certainly used for other, for other reasons, but that's their, their primary market there. On the flip side, most people, if not all, that were representing the urban interests felt that the urban needs are not being met. And they were interested in looking at different structures of whether there's a different way to do this that ended up helping facilitate uh, transit service for the, for the uh, residents of the urban areas. Um, and there's certainly a lot of detail involved in this beyond that, but that, that's kind of the the big, the big takeaway there, which is that the urban areas and the rural areas are not seeing eye to eye about whether what's currently um, in place is working or not. Um, the peer reviews end up selecting eight areas for peer review. Um, you can see them kind of as a swath across the middle of Texas there. We pick four of them where the same entity provides the urban and rural transit service. In essence, like Hill Country Transit District, where you have one, uh, one governmental entity, it's providing all of the service. Uh, an example of that in this list, for example, is off to your right there in the orange and Bryan College Station area, Brazos Transit District provides service in both the uh, 
Bryan College Station uh, urbanized area as well as a big swath of East Texas for rural service. And then we pick four that are split differently, that are generally split between urban and rural, but they can be even split a little bit more than that. Probably the main example I wanna to draw to your attention here is the Waco area, just, just north of you. Uh, they have actually three districts that cover the service in that area, two rural districts and one urban district. Um, Odessa Midlands, another good one. There's an urbanized, uh, urban transit district for the uh, Odessa Midland urbanized areas, which actually are two separate urbanized areas like um, Temple and Colleen are. And then there's a separate agency that provides the rural service. So we assess the peers in terms of cost, cost efficiency and service effectiveness, especially focusing on whether there are differences that arise due to the either aggregate or disaggregate structure. And generally what we found is that service is more cost efficient in areas where the responsibility for urban and rural transit is divided between multiple agencies. On your left, you'll see, for example, the uh, average cost per hour, which is how we typically look at cost efficiency in transit. Uh, you'll see the Hill Country Transit is actually a little high off there on the left. And in general, the ones with the blue bars, which are the uh, aggregate districts are higher and they come out higher as an average as well. While on the rural service side, um, Hill Country Transit District is actually a little bit low, um, meaning co more cost efficient. So the cost efficiency breaks out a little bit more that the fixed route service is a little expensive and the rural service is a little bit, a little bit cheaper than average right now. The case studies I mentioned were, were intended to look at different ways that uh, the transit governance is structured in Texas to see if it could point us toward uh, models that we wanted to look at for the Hill Country Transit area. Uh, they de demonstrated different structures, different funding, um, and ultimately the Midland Odessa uh, case study and the Waco studies uh, provided guidance for two of the alternatives that you'll look at. The other two I did want to mention, though, up in the upper right-hand corner of the purple, that's ArcTex Council of Government. Um, it is an ArcTex Council of Governments, but its transit division is just in Texas, so we're not trying to look across state lines, which gets quite complicated. But the reason we end up looking at the ArcTex area is it was another agency that about 20 years ago started getting hit very hard with the reduction in funds from the Medicaid service. But they were quite... Um, aggressive and creative and looking at ways to uh, develop new funding sources or replace those. So during the period in essence where Hill Country Transit was reducing services from lack of funds, uh, ArcTex has actually increased services pretty significantly in some of, their, uh, some of the smaller towns up there as well as commuter service into the Texarkana area. Um, and then the little blue dot down on the right near Houston, that's Fort Bend County. And we had profiled it because, again, it's just a different governance structure. There, uh, transit is provided as a department of the county government, which is actually quite unusual in Texas. We don't see that a whole lot. Um, it may not be something we want to do here, but it was, a, again, a different way that um, you can go about approaching transit in Texas effectively. So the options were designed to be plausible ways of meeting the goals as expressed by the stakeholders while still being acceptable to them. There's no way we we're gonna pull out something really weird that nobody was gonna to wanna to see. Um, tried to make them as distinct from one another as possible, although there is, a, there is a continuum, if you will, between options two and three, you'll see that they're not completely distinct. And they were meant to be illustrative of the different structures for provision of transit in Texas today. Um, it's possible you could have gone outside of Texas for some of your examples, but I think some of the goals of this study were what can we do um, reasonably, I won't say easily, but reasonably easy. Right now, as long as we stick with some of the structures that, that are done in Texas that are allowed under current state law, there is no requirement for any legislative action to change a district that you're in or change the um, membership of a district. I didn't want to get into something that was so different. It took us legislation to be able to do it. 
So here are the four options. Option one, because it is an option to stay what you're doing now. This is the current structures. One joint urban and rural transit district operating under the name of Hill Country Transit District. It's got one independent board. It's composed of, comprised of the urban and rural representatives. This is one of the places that's in some ways created, I guess, some of the tensions you have seen. Uh, the state law dictates the composition of that board. And it is a representative, an elected official of the nine counties that are in there and the five cities that are considered urban. So despite the fact that if we said, you know, 80 something percent of the riders and the population in the urban area, the urban area is only five out of the 14 on the district, uh, the district's board of directors. And that's not something that, that can be changed without changing state law. Um, the current structure has advantages. It does facilitate regional transit connections. Uh, if that's something that's important, it's very easy. Theoretically, you can get on a bus and travel from one end of this big nine county region to another without having to pay a second fare, having to transfer buses. It, it, it allows that movement, even if it's not something that's done very often. Because it's existing structure, obviously it's simplest, has no transition costs. As Brent said, we don't need an implementation plan. You know, you're already doing it. Hang on a second, my computer just did something. Okay, can y'all still see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, and the rural service is very well liked and it's comparatively cost efficient. Disadvantages are, the urban areas obviously have different needs than the rural areas. And a lot of that has been, I think, due to the growth. You know, if you look at the history of the population, as, as you all know, your two urban areas have grown quite rapidly over the last 20 years, while the uh, uh, rural counties have been very stable in population. And the Hill Country Transit District's pretty much doing things the same way they did 20 years ago. It hasn't been particularly responsive to the, to the growth and to the changing needs. Um, one of the probably the biggest disadvantage, particularly as it relates to governance, is no one has really, um, I guess, control over the service or how its monies are used because it all goes into the one board. And the urban service, we would like to see a little bit more cost efficient than is being done under the current structure. And that may be a function of the aggregate structure, as we saw from the peers. The urban service at the peers that were just focused on urban service tended to be less ex tended to be less expensive per uh, per revenue hour. Option two is the first split, which is kind of the easiest one. Is let's just make two districts: an urban transit district that combines the Colleen and Temple urbanized areas, and one rural district for the not the eight other rural counties plus the rural portion of Bell County. You'd have two independent boards. The rural board would still be, in essence, required by TxDOT to have uh, one representative from each county. Wouldn't have any city reps then because it has no urbanized area, no urbanized areas left. Um, the urban transit board, there is a lot less in the state law that tells you how that has to be structured. It looks pretty much like you can structure it however you want. For example, Midland Odessa. Uh, urban Transit District has equal representation from Midland, Ode Midland, City of Midland and City of Odessa, and they set it up to be that way, even though they're not exactly the same size. But they decided from a governance perspective, they wanted to be equal partners. Um, advantages, the urban and rural service could be more responsive to the changing needs in their areas. The rural service may pretty much stay like it is. The urban service can decide if they want to do things different. It significantly increases local control, particularly on the urbanized area side. And it's potentially more cost effective if you look at the peer data and what it tells us about uh, splitting these urban and rural areas into different, into different providers. They're just, their services are so different that there is very little that you could say gives you an economies of scale from combining them. Um, disadvantages, it could be more difficult to make regional connections. You can certainly work that out, but it's now you have two agencies. You might have to have some sort of fair sharing plan, some sort of transfers, you know, however you wanted to do it. Um, you, you can't necessarily share overhead costs in the same way, although I will say that there are very little shared costs between the rural and urban today, and that tends to be 
um, offset by the added efficiencies on the operating side by splitting the two. Um, and then obviously there would be some transition costs and that would be for us to determine an implementation plan. What would that be to split into two entities? Um, you know, there's an issue of shared assets. You have to decide who owns what, you know, who owes who, owes who for what local costs that may have been put in, for example, in the construction of the uh, operating facility. Option three is the same as option two with one exception. We now we have two rural transit districts. You would have a separate rural transit district just for rural Bell County. Option three, if option two, which I didn't mention is kind of the Midland Odessa uh, model, uh, two urban areas operating as one urban transit district and then a rural transit district separately. Option three is, is really the Waco model. Uh, in Waco, they have the city of Waco providing the city service. They have a rural McLennan County transit district. And then they have the heart of Texas COG, which provides the rural service and the remainder of the counties. Um, so we would some, set up something similar here. One thing to note though, these are governance structures. They're not operating structures. We wouldn't suddenly create an, its own little special transit agency that's running buses around under the name of rural uh, Bell County. They would undoubtedly simply uh, uh, contract for that service with either the current urban or the current rural or, or the new urban or the current rural provider. The point would be is that you would have the funds that are allocable to rural Bell County coming straight to the county and then the county would decide how it wants to spend those monies. So the biggest advantage is uh, even more local control than you would have in the prior one. The urban and rural areas could be responsive to whatever their particular needs are. Rural Bell County might be able or would capture more funding and therefore have more comprehensive service if it had those monies coming directly to it. And there is a demonstrated model in the Waco area that we would be able to follow. Uh, disadvantages are similar to disadvantages of option two. Regional connections could be more difficult. Um, and you just have to, it can be done. You just have to figure out a way to do it. Um, it's possible you're in options two and option three. You still may just have one operating entity uh, and the different districts contract with that operating entity for the service, but they have control of how their monies are spent and, and where the, where the uh, grant monies go. Uh, disadvantage again is more complex than option one or two because you've got two different uh, entities. And then the eight county rural transit district, I said could, probably would end up with less funding. You know, it's kind of a zero sum game a little bit when it comes to uh, grant monies. So if rural Bell County is picking up more, it would be coming out of the eight county rural transit district. Someone asked me two days ago if that was, if, the, if there was the potentials that shifting those monies to rural Bell County would take money away from urban Bell County and that would not be the case. And the uh, transit world, rural funds have to be rural and urban funds have to be urban. So that's, that's, not, a, that's not a concern there. Uh, one other thing to mention about option three is it could be a stepping stone or option two could be a stepping stone to option three. There's no reason you have to do it all at one time. You could split between your urban and rural areas. And then later, if the uh, county, Bell County decided there was an advantage to making its own rural district, it could do that at that time. And then option four is a little bit different. I thought of this as different goals. Um, one of the other things that came out in the, uh, particularly in the stakeholder interviews is really Temple and Colleen UZAs may be next to one another, but they're very different. The economies are different, the populations are different, the needs are different. So what if we left the rural altogether, the eight counties plus rural Bell County, but split uh, between Colleen and Temple? Um, you'd have two city councils or independent boards operating as your uh, governing body for each of the urban transit districts, and then you'd have your rural transit district board. Um, I would see that it would be Colleen and Temple that would lead each of those, but it doesn't have to be. But let's just say for a moment that, for example, the, the Temple, City of Temple 
became the transit provider for the Temple area, they could certainly then set up a contract with Belton to provide the service to Belton as well so that you can cover the full UZAs. Other thing to mention here is municipal transit is probably the most common structure or is the most common structure for small urban transit delivery in Texas. Um, that's the way most transit was provided up until about 25 years ago when TxDOT created the uh, urban and rural transit district structures that you can see today. So there's certainly a lot of history um, behind having municipal transit departments. Another thing to mention on this, it's a little different ways to think about this is if you have an urban or if you have a municipal transit agency, it's a department of the city. So it would share city overhead costs for things like, I don't know, human resources, legal department, procurement. And because there's some portion of those overhead costs that are become transit monies, they become they are transit expenditures, they are eligible then for federal transit grants. So a lot of cities have feel they are being able to, to get a benefit from having the transit to be a, par a part of the cities because they can use it as a way to help pay for some of the overhead that is being, is being um, uh, used by the transit department. It's not a huge amount, but it, it, you know, as y'all know, in the cities, every little bit helps. Um, and really it's a control issue here is the advantage. It may be that Temple and Colleen, as we know, they're very different. Maybe they have different ideas about how much they want to invest in transit or what kind of services they want to provide. And it means they can independently decide how best to serve their residents. The, diff the disadvantages obviously would be travel between not just the, the rural areas and the urban areas are more difficult, but travel between the cities could be more difficult. You could certainly arrange things but you might have to make sure to set up something to where people can transfer from one bus to another if you're, or have one route that's, that's shared costs between the cities. It just gets a little more complicated. There's no reason it can't be done. It just has to be worked through. And the distribution of assets between the cities could be more complex, particularly because there's only one urban operating facility right now, uh, the one that's in Belton. But again, through contracting, whether contracting with each other or contracting with a private provider, you can certainly you can certainly uh, get around that issue. And it risks fragmenting the region. If we think that Temple and Colleen are better served by thinking together and regionally working together, that's one thing. If we think they're better served by going their separate ways, then that may be the best thing too. But uh, there is a risk of fragmenting the region. And I put in this possible reducing funding partners because I was trying to think through future funding partners that might be uh, colleges, universities, major employers, major hospital districts. And it may be that they don't wanna have to deal with two separate agencies in two separate cities. You know, Maybe they'd like to, they feel they draw their clients and their employees from all over the greater Temple Colleen region. And they would like to just work with one entity, not two to, to best serve that goal. So my initial recommendation was option three, mostly because it best meets the needs of the local communities. Uh, it had more favorable and unfavorable assessments on most of the criteria I was using, but again, it's not the simplest option. There is a complexity there. Uh, some of that is mitigated by the fact that we have a model uh, in Waco to look at, but Waco didn't do it all as one. They, they started out as a city a municipal provider plus the rural provider. And it was just actually four or five years ago that they split McLennan County into its own rural district as well. But, no but here, see if I can Runner up is option two, the one urban transit district and one rural transit district. And the assessment, it didn't have as many strong advantages, but it didn't have as many strong disadvantages either. It was pretty evenly split on favorable and unfavorable assessments. And as I mentioned before, it could be seen as a first step toward option three. It's just a little bit simpler. It might be a little bit easier to get to. But I want to say that still not bad are options one and four. You know, option one, which you have today, is certainly seen all over the state and various places. It, it can work. Um, 
it struggles to meet the needs of the, the communities, particularly in Bell, in Bell County, both urban and rural, but it's maybe that that can be addressed through management and a different kind of board leadership than you've seen today. Maybe it doesn't require a different structure. Uh, it does. It is gonna want some change in the sense of whether it's direction to management or direction from the local partners to its board about what you wanna see in order to make it work, but it's not a bad option. And similarly, option four isn't bad either. Um, it's complex. It's very different from what you've seen before. But to the extent that the cities want to be self-determining and, and don't want to have to do the same thing as all the other cities, you know, maybe Temple um, has got more interest than Colleen in developing public transit. So maybe it's easier just to go your own way. It's that high degree of local control that gives option four some advantages. Um, but it requires a lot of, a lot of uh, governance structures and complexities to get there. But all four of them have their pros and cons and, and can work. It's a matter of, uh, or will they be made to work? And I believe that's the last slide. So from there, um, I'd like to, I think, turn it back to Brand to facilitate the discussion or, to, or I can answer any questions y'all have. Council, any questions? That's a difficult consultant job, Ms. Edmonds. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I think is most difficult is not being able to see y'all. I feel like I'm uh, talking into a mirror here. I'm, I'm hoping that everybody was was a. Uh, was engaged, but, you know, it's very hard to tell. Y'all do have that one little square here, but y'all are all about, you know, like in two point type size there. So I'm not sure if I could really get any expressions out of you. No, I appreciate the way that the four options were broken down. I think they're easily understood. Um, and I, you know, I think all along that the, uh, that the urban areas have been getting the short end of the stick, so to speak. So I think some action is going to have to be taken to be able to um, help our citizens here in Temple. And I'm sure in Colleen, um, you know, get get more uh, get more for what we're paying for. Yeah. So uh, obviously the bulk of the ridership across the whole system is right here in Bell County. Yeah, absolutely. But the board is made up of majority of the rural counties. Mm -hmm. And that's a state law. So yeah, you know, everyone has represented. Yeah. It would not change your state law. Right. I'm not going to say anything else about that in public. <laughs> 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 Council, let me. So the Wago model is essentially um, Nancy's option three. Yeah. And only um, and Nancy can correct me if I'm wrong, but the main difference between, or I think the main um, Factor that led her to favor option three over option two was the fact that currently rural Bell County gets less service and pays more for that service than the other eight counties. There's a disparity in what our county, and, and it's not that the it's not the residents within the urban areas, but the, the rest of the county. Um, they can only currently use a transit service for medical trips, whereas um, a resident of any of the other eight counties can get um, service for anything, you know, a, a party, I think, you know, anything. And um, I don't, I do not think, I didn't realize that until Nancy um, uncovered that as part of her study. I do not think Bell County Commissioner's Court knew that. Um, and as, as Nancy mentioned, we did, um, we did ask the, um, the current interim director to provide some input on, on why that was or how that happened. And she 
Um, she's been there a long time. Um, not as obviously as director, she was formerly, or she's her, her day job is the finance. Um, I'm not sure what her exact title is, but she runs the financial side. Um, she said that it was, she would estimate that it happened at least somewhere between 10 and 15 years ago, probably closer to 15. It was not a board level decision. The staff made it without, um, without board input. And the reason was that they felt like, the staff felt like if they offered that same level of service to Bell County because of Bell County's population, it would, she didn't say it this way, but I'll paraphrase and she probably wouldn't appreciate it, but it would reduce the service in the other eight counties. So instead of reducing the service in the other eight counties, they decided to restrict the service in Bell County so they could keep the eight counties having that option without uh, local financial contrib contributions being required from any of the counties. Yeah, and as, as Brenda's mentioned, I mean, we didn't get too much into the point wasn't to get too much into the finances, but y'all probably know the rural counties do not provide any local share right now for the services. The only governmental entities participating are the cities and Bell County. So I think, I'm sorry, I kind of got off track there. What I was saying is the, the big difference between option two and option three is letting Bell County have their own board to control their own funding. But um, when, when Nancy made this presentation to the staff team, I asked her the question, um, is if the board, if the current Hill Country Transit District Board decided to uh, correct that discrepancy, that disparity rather, would there be a strong, um, Would there be as maybe as strong of a um, benefit to doing option three versus option two? And while that's not the only only reason you would consider it, that that was I think the main driver between option two and option three. Yeah. To me, option three is between option two and option three is really a Bell County decision because it the, the only entity that whose service, whose governance would change between option two and option three would be Bell County. So if they were interested in going um, on their own, then, you know, that would be something to consider. But if they're not, it doesn't impact the city of Temple or any of, of the other cities. Um, so, and, and based on my um, listening into the commissioner's court uh, meeting, I don't think that they're um, wanting to explore that option. So, um, I think uh, the Bell County Commissioner's Court didn't provide any strong, um, and Nancy, would you agree they, they seem to yeah. not, not be um, heading down that path, and Judge Black I, is on our um, working group team, has definitely stated he prefers to look at option two. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think they're very interested in that issue, but I think what the, the judge and uh, the other county commissioners hope is that they can address it within either the current structure or with an option two without having to create um, a special district. And if they couldn't, then down the road, you could always do that. If they end up, you know, kind of end up a battle with the other eight counties that they lose, they can always go out on their own at that point. One of the issues in Temple has been the reduction of service. Um, we've, we've had folks come and speak to council you know, over the years about that. Um, and I, I didn't realize that the rural portion of Bell County was not being treated. Um, you know, that, that they have this other uh, restriction on it just for medical purposes. Is there a way to, um, of course I know the board would have to vote on it, but is there a way to equalize the service in Bell County and I realize that would be hurting the other counties, but is there a way to equalize the service in Bell County and I guess sort of go with status quo with the tweak? Does that make sense? Uh, certainly with the Bell County issue, yes. You know, they can, you, you know, y'all, the 
the current board could change that tomorrow. You know, it could just simply say that Bell County residents have the same access to service or any purpose as anybody else. And then when you see where demand goes, then they can decide whether or not that works or whether it outstrips the current resources. So I think that one is certainly, for that matter, any of this is changeable in the current structure. I mean, you have a you have an entity in place that you could, if the board votes on it, you know, they can decide to deploy resources in whatever way that they want. I think but the that's question not happen because of the board structure. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a question about whether that will happen or not, I suppose to be the real question. I think certainly with the Bell County, rural Bell County issue is certainly addressable. I think it's a bigger question of whether ultimately in the current structure, you could ever get to where you want to be in the urban, the urban service. Because if the urban service is gonna require, continue to require the cities to be funding partners in an entity that they do not have control over, I just don't see that that's gonna end up producing um, either the sufficient funding or the type of services that you might wanna see in the future. You're always gonna have that imbalance, if you will, between the funding partners and the voting members, as long as you stick with the current structure. Not, not that the people in the rural counties are trying to deliberately you know, outvote you. It's just the fact of the matter is it's a it's a rural transit provider that has suddenly, you know, since been thrust into the role of an urban transit agency and whether or not it's equipped for that or the governance is equipped for it is the question. Just for cl clarity to make sure we're all on the same page, the Bell County issue is, it does not affect residents within cities in Bell County. It's just those that are, so the, the board could change that tomorrow, but that wouldn't give city of Temple residents any more service. Yeah. At only a, a non-city Bell County. And, and even at that, it's a little more complicated than that because there's a portion of the county that's in the urban zone. So it's just the people who live outside the urban zones, um, but inside Bell County that have that different service. The, the residents of cities, unless you uh, qualify for the paratransit, the complimentary paratransit service, you don't have door-to-door -door options. So you have to be on the fixed route unless you have a, um, a disability or some other qualifying factor and you live close enough to a um, fixed route that you qualify for that service. So yep. unlike in the other eight counties, you no resident of Bell County, even a resident of the city could call um, you know, for a kind of a door-to-door -door transfer unless they meet those special considerations. So, so am I understanding this correctly? Any change in the rural aspect, Bell County needs to be on board with that. You go with a split rural district or keep it the same district. We have a decision to make the citizens of Temple. And that's either the, the two urban approach, Temple and Colleen, or one urban approach, but that's contingent on Colleen wanting to join with us and doing the one urban approach. So while we can do options, we need input from other folks as to which one truly makes sense. I, I'm in favor of us controlling our own destiny as best we can. If that's a service to provide for our community, then let's be in charge of it. But it'll, it, it, they, how they react will tell us which of those models work best for our decision to, to be in control of public transportation. And Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think, I think yes. So. One, one thing that is noted in Nancy's full report um, is the fact, and again, this was a governance structure study, but none of these options is some kind of silver bullet to, to dramatically change the level of service that would be available um, without additional funding coming in, right? So it's not so inefficient right now that just by changing the governance, you are all of a sudden going to get all of this great, you know, improved service. Now, 
And again, this also wasn't a route study, and I think we'll get there, but there within your current, how you're spending your current dollars, I think you could have some better, and I think Nancy would agree, you, the routes are probably not the best. So there, there, um, there could be some increases in service level or, or changes in service level, but it's not gonna be this dramatic shift without the willingness of um, the either, you know, we as local governments um, to contribute more from general funding and or the opportunity to explore other funding partnerships. As Nancy mentioned, there are successful models um, that, sh that she's aware of and that are included in the reports that she's provided us um, where higher education institutes participate, um, employer, major employers. Um, so uh, there, but just for a, uh, I guess, an order of magnitude, um, if you, I, I looked at this yesterday, um, the, if you look at the case studies that Nancy provided, um, Midland Odessa, area, the Waco area, um, and the um, Arc Tex area. Um, if you look at their local, their general fund, what they're paying from their general fund, it ranges from, I'm, memory is like 450 at the lowest to 850-ish at the highest. Um, Midland Odessa is in the middle. They mid, both Midland and Odessa contribute six hundred thousand dollars a year from their general funds. So before the pandemic, um, we we were in the a hundred and thirty uh, to a hundred and sixty range, just depending on um, the allocation that can, you know. There's a different allocation that's provided every year. Um, so I think. And again, this was not a financial study in terms of, I mean, there's financial data in there, but I think that can give us some realistic idea about if, if we, and all those areas have much, a much greater level of service than we do. Yeah. So if we're looking at increasing our service, you know, more than just kind of making some tweaks that would be minor improvements, we're gonna be, we're gonna be looking, I, I, I believe at, um, a more substantial local contribution. Um, Over and above the half a million or so of these other cities we have. Because if we're doing 130 now, half a million dollars or 600,000 doesn't seem like a huge leap versus two or three million dollars. Right. So you would it would be comparing, uh, uh, we would need to get, that, that's a whole other evaluation, I'm but just using some of the, the numbers that you can maybe extrapolate some um, assumptions from is if we're currently contributing 150,000, this, and we want more service, other cities that we studied are contributing somewhere between 450 and $850,000 each. Right? So our, so we would be looking probably to get a more robust service you're going to be somewhere in that range, I would think, versus the 130. But there's all sorts of factors involved, including whether you um, continue to provide Medicaid service and, and get you know that level of funding in, whether you get employer participation or higher education partnerships. Um, you know, there's other. I'm, I'm sure we can be uh, uh, creative in other ways. But the the bottom line is there's there's nothing. Um, nothing about any of these four options that without additional funding is going to fundamentally just, you know, we're going to wake up next year and have much better transit service. Right. I think that's a really good summary, Brennan. I think the point of all that is that it's up to the, you know, each the city and the region to decide how much they want to invest in transit, obviously. But I think the question is if you ever have any interest in investing more than you are today, the question is, which organizational structure are you willing to make that investment in? Are you willing to turn over more monies to a nine county rural transit district and hope that those dollars get deployed in the ways you'd like to see it? Or do you need to have a structure in place that gives you more control over that? And thank you, Nancy, for that, because that, that is kind of my final point, is that I, I don't, if I don't, I have not heard 
any conversation among the other current partners of Hill Country Transit District that are looking at um, making any, I don't think they're thinking in terms of additional local share. So that would be a challenge to overcome in options one, two, or three, in that you would be potentially partnering it, and, and the question is, if you want to make, if you want to invest more local money, that's the first question. Then the, the second question, as Nancy said, is how and what organization do you want to make that investment? And if the rest of the region is not making that investment, you may you may have challenges getting what you are looking for if you don't go all the way to option four. Um, I don't, so. I don't know that Colleen um, or that, or I, I don't think Harker Heights, um, I'm not sure about Copper's Cove, but I don't think Colleen or Harker Heights are in a position where they're looking at providing additional funding towards transit. But we're talking about the government structure and exploring how it can be put together. Exactly. Um, you don't have to, the day you go to that new government structure, spend $900,000. You grow it over time, but you control the decision process, you control the routing process, and you grow it as your community grows and you provide the service to your residents. So I don't want us to think that, well, if we vote to do this tomorrow, we have to come up with $900,000. No. That's not the case, right? Right. I'm sorry if I implied that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, but that's the, that's the right. normal jump that people have when you do that. If the, to me, to be at the mercy, if you will, of the rural counties is not the best place for the urban population to be. They have their set of priorities and their citizens that they are taking care of. And good for them. We have an obligation to work with our community citizens to provide them service that makes sense and is feasible and well run. And if we're not in control of that aspect, it's not going to happen. So if we're just studying governance organizations and well and find out more about how that would look and how it would function, I think we need to look at what's best for Temple, Texas. And if somebody else wants to join us and make it a joint urban and not too urban, that's fine. So my recommendation um, for so as a reminder, we are. We, we are the lead contracting agency with Nancy, but we have an interlocal agreement where, all, where um, several other people, have several, again, four other cities and eight counties have also contributed. So um, my recommendation based on, you know, let me say it better. I think that it would be great if we saw a path forward, understood what, what um, option two and option four look like. Option two, because that's um, that's certainly a, a good valid option, and that's what um, we probably should have built out in the implementation plan for this study, because it makes the most sense for the other agencies that are participating. And I think, based on what I've been hearing, I think that's what um, the consensus. There's going to be a consensus around option two, but I would also. Um, suggest that separately we ask Nancy to provide us with an implementation plan for option four, just so we, you as the City of Temple Council can evaluate staying how we are, going going as you know a single urban if we can reach some consensus and build some, um, you know, build a good structure within Bell County, or if, if not, then you have the third option of, of considering kind of your own district. Yeah. And in that case, the option four would be option four, but not instead of, it would just be in essence Temple. I mean, we would just look at what it takes to take Temple on its own, regardless of what Colleen chose to do. They might choose to stay with the current district, who knows, but. This is a open session. I was just curious, when you talk about Temple Urban, are you talking about the ETJ also? Because the ETJ has grown in leaps and bounds in the way of population, more houses, more structures and stuff. Is that covered under the Temple Urban or is that covered under Bell County? 
don't know that yet. That's a good question. And uh, Brent, if y'all have a map of your ETH, D, ETJ, I could set that against the, the UZA or what they call the urbanized area map and we could see how much they overlap. But in general, your, your urban transit funding that would be coming to the city of Temple would be for what the FTA calls an urbanized area. And it, has, it does not necessarily follow city um, incorporation lines. Uh, so probably if your ETJ is, is uh, growing and, uh, and densifying, it's probably already in your UZA, but we can check that and see. I know that the UZA goes beyond the current city limits uh, right now. I just don't know how far it is or how it compared to what your ETJ looks like. I'm curious as to what impact if the city of Temple, if urbanized, if Bell County, Colleen, Temple, and then Bell County as an organization were to go their separate ways, so to speak, what financial impact, which obviously then becomes a service impact, is that going to have to the other counties? Um, the only th the urban areas going their own ways would not have any impact on the other counties because this distinction between rural and, and uh, urban funding. So it wouldn't change the rural side. The only thing that would change the funding to the other eight counties is if they start deploying more service in rural Bell County and therefore those monies are rural funds, they would have to come out of the other eight counties. Um, it's not a huge amount, um, when you spread it across state counties, but given the, the tightness of the finances of the Hill Country Transit, I think you would have some impact on the other counties. Or if Bell County decided to form its own rural district. So yeah, yeah. So, in the, so y'all don't have to worry, I guess, in a sense on the urbanized side, you're not taking money out of the rural counties' pockets. That's more of a debate between the rural counties and rural Bell County than it is between the urban and the rural. Is, is funding based on population? It, it's got a number of factors, but uh, popular. It also includes uh, on the rural side. It's it, population dominates, but it also includes square miles, and then a couple of other weird factors. It has to do with the level of efficiency of the service, but population makes more impact than anything does. So that's something that's happening, not just here, but that's kind of what happened in, in McLennan County as well. So you've got these rural transit districts where you've got a whole bunch of counties that are all very low density, not a lot of people, not growing very fast. And then you've got one county who's generally surrounding an urban area who's growing much more rapidly, has most of the people, and then therefore most of the, you know, a lot of the funding is attributable to those counties. And are any of the ones that are now currently separate urban and uh, rural zones, were they ever combined like we are now? They've gone through the process of, of separating? Uh, no middle and Odessa, I know middle and Odessa did. It was all one back until the late 1990s when they split off and created their own urban transit district. Um, let me think for a second about the other what we call disaggregate peers. Um, that's the only one I can think of offhand because the others tended to ev have evolved from having had a municipal transit agency long before these districts existed and that were always separate from the rural provider. Uh, Middle and Odessa is the only one I can think of, but I'll check on the other three. I'm drawing a blank on. One of them is Waco and it wasn't because City of Waco has been its own transit provider for years. And I'm trying to think of what the other two are. Um, but I think they were also ones that, that developed from a municipal, not having a split from a rural. Waco rural county though recently split. Yeah, yeah, I did. That, that's been within the last four or five years. I'd have to check the date. It used to be part, it, the rural part of McLennan County used to be part of the Heart of Texas uh, Council of Government Service, and they split a few years ago. Really, 
for the same reason that you might see in Bell County in order to capture more of those funds for the uh, rural McLennan County area. And then they contract with the city of Waco to provide their service. And they're you're doing some kind of creative things there. They're doing, they, they have the rural, the kind of the typical demand response rural service in rural McLennan County, but they're also using some of those funds, rural funds to provide more work commuter type services from the rural parts of the county into jobs in the city. And that's a legitimate use of those rural funds as well. So is everyone okay with uh, pursuing the implementation plan for option two and option four? Thank you, Nancy. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be talking to you all soon. Why do we not look at that? Three, different people, different things. From my standpoint, again, that's really the only entity that that, sh that, that affects differently than option two does is Bell County. And they don't want, at this point, they've indicated they don't want to explore that. Yeah. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change anything for us um, from option two, just for them. You can you say that earlier. It's very complicated, it but Nancy does know what she's, she's, she's been very helpful. So we appreciate that uh, opportunity to do study. I think it's been very important. I'd be interested at some point to see the, uh, the dollar impact of the options also. Though that wasn't the scope of this current study. But. Right. Before you ultimately make a decision, you'll, yeah, you'll have to um, address that. But, um, I, I, think, I think you can, in I think you can be informed about, I don't think it's to, to split off and do the exact same service that we're doing right now. Um, you know, I think it's going to be cost equivalent. It's the, if you want to increase the service, that's when additional funding will be needed to be developed, whether that be from general fund and or some other uh, creative combination of Finding partners. Many of the people need to get to work, and that's really the other important part is we need to get to the medical facilities. Besides shopping and all that, but those are the two main factors that I see, as well as higher education. We have a need to get to school. So there's three areas that really need to be addressed that be sure that we can provide some kind of Option for them to be able to get to those locations. I, I agree with that. One of the frustrating things, whenever we talk about transportation, is that the ridership, the actual fare box, mm -hmm. you know, in this presentation accounts for about five percent of the budget. So, you know, we're we're talking about a, a lot of tax dollars being spent on um, being allocated toward. But if we look at it, it doesn't address the industrial area, the working, it doesn't address you know, edu higher education, it doesn't address certain components of the community that are really in the infrastructure. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, it a also lot sounds like the current administration hasn't really been very progressive in looking for other funding. I think it's important to remember also that. The hop, there are admin offices, Grand San Sapi, right? Everybody thinks they're out here on 190 or on I 14, but they're not. Yeah. That's their main uh, service area. But the decisions about these rural counties are made by people living in rural counties. And then the board, you know, the, the impact of the board, which all, all nine out of the 14 members are. In rural in the rural areas, is that right? Five out of fourteen. Eight, it, it, 
depending on how you count Bell County, because it's both it has rural a rural uh, urban area and a rural area. But eight of the count, eight of the representatives are purely rural. You've got Bell County and then the five cities. And are all eight of those rural counties contributing zero dollars? Yeah. Only Bell County and those five, yeah, are are paying. Does, does Heights pay and Co pay? So all the cities are paying something. Yes. Bell County is paying something. Yes. And then nobody else is paying anything. Right, so they have the majority position on the board. Right. Yeah. And again, that's just that's a that's a state law function. Just so. <laughs> what have you been doing all this time? All right, are we ready to move on? Don, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you um, see my slideshow? Not yet. Not yet. You haven't shared your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, all right. How about now? Yes. So you're in uh, presenter mode. Oh, yeah. Okay. What do you want me to do, Alan? Um, does that look better? Does that does that look right? No. Uh, go back to go back to um, slideshow mode. Okay, um, I do. I hit F5 and it's in slideshow mode. But um, there's a button that says resume slide. Oh. Try that again. There you go. Okay. Is that advancing correctly? No. <laughs> <laughs> you resumed. Okay, how about this? Is that looking correct for you? No. No. <laughs> you done? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, if you go and resume your slideshow, uh, you can actually get rid of that presenter. I can get rid of the what? Presentation screen. If you can get back into the full, the actual. Uh, Slideshow, and if you click on those three dots, right there. No. Yeah. I present our view. Is this looking right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you still have to get into the full the actual slideshow. Okay, I've got it maximized on my screen. It's it's full presentation mode. It has been the whole time. But I've got. I've uh, also got two screens. Get out of the slideshow one more time and then go back into it. Now, is there an option near the top of your screen that says Switch presenter mode, or or is there? There you go. Yeah. Swap presenter. There you go. Yay! So what that did on my end was basically switch the screens. I apologize about that. I thought I had it figured out um, to do it through Zoom instead of Teams, but we'll make up some time get into it. Uh, what you're looking at here is Clarifier at our potable water treatment plant. Uh, one of the things that uh, utilities achieved this past quarter was to get this thing up to snuff. Um, they got it to achieve its full design capacity through a combination of equipment retrofits as well as operational adjustments. 
and that's not all they did. And this is an incomplete list, but um, I highlight a couple of things on here for you. Um, our vector dump station, um, through picking a different delivery mode, which is basically us constructing it instead of a contractor and picking a different location and picking a different configuration for it, saved almost a half a million dollars of uh, estimated capital cost on that. And then a little farther down the list, um, if you'll note that on August 14th, uh, we have a new record for how much uh, treated water we um, produced out of the plant in one day. So very notable. The uh, fleet division placed 60 vehicles in service and they're still working on some more. So we'll have an update on some more vehicles that got placed in service our next uh, quarterly update. Um, would like to thank them for working a couple of Saturdays in November just to keep up. Uh, transportation, a couple of pedestrian projects. Um, in addition to everything that they're, they're, they always get done, um, for example, uh, this past quarter, uh, they averaged a fix of uh, 51 potholes per workday. So um, I'm very proud of them for keeping up and getting all the work done despite being short staffed. So if you, next time you see a transportation employee, hug them from six feet away. And this is just a view of the, um, the crossing on South Fifth Street. Uh, this is a dashboard view that our engineering division put together. And these are the numbers as they were at the end of the quarter, October, November, December. Um, they're managing a you know, pretty hefty workload as indicated by the total number of projects, that's 93. Um, you're gonna see different numbers the next time you look at this, if it's in the next update, the total cost of our construction contracts um, with the uh, water treatment plants membrane expansion is going to be 117 million. And then total cost of our design contracts is just a little bit over 45 million. And probably over the next few months, they're gonna add probably at least another $50 million of estimated construction costs. So very busy group there and they continue to, to get a lot done each quarter. Uh, the, no, the smaller numbers that you're seeing at the top of this slide um, is basically just the invoices that they did this past quarter. So that's how they kind of keep track of how busy they are with that workload on, on a monthly basis. And the uh, plats, permits, and plans numbers that you see there is basically their support of development through the planning department. So that's all done um, in coordination with planning and permits. And they uh, convinced my bosses to crawl down a tunnel. So that was fun. I got some kids. We got some construction projects completed. Um, it's fair, Fairview and Sunset drainage project um, turned out really well. Um, really feel like we had good construction phase coordination on that. I would say the same thing for the Azalea drainage project. Um, I was uh, kind of interested to see how that would play out in, um, in these developed neighborhoods, but um, seemed to turn out really well. So we're glad to get those done. Also the most recent phase of Outer Loop 3B, of the Outer Loop, which is 3B. Uh, back to utilities, um, I want to uh, just kind of direct your attention to the highlighted text. Um, there's numbers and graphs on here, but um, really just qualitatively, uh, we went from a very understaffed collections and distribution division within utilities uh, to being mostly staffed. And then also as far as the, um, the training of our workforce, um, utilities went from being a mostly unlicensed uh, in collections and, and distribution, so that's the water and sewer crews, they went from being a mostly unlicensed workforce to a mostly licensed workforce. Um, a lot of hard work on part of a lot of employees, so I appreciate that. 
And along with that, not coincidentally, um, water leaks are down from a typical running list of active water leaks is, is would was around 50 at the beginning of the year. And um, typical size of the list these days is five. So a tenfold decrease in the number of active water leaks. And that's just a, a step on the journey we wanna to take towards um, going from a reactive stance on these water leaks to proactive. We'd really like to just, instead of having a list of water leaks, be out there looking for them and trying to detect them. Uh, we got several major projects going on. Going to highlight a few of these. Um, on the solid waste complex, we settled on a layout for that facility. Uh, you're looking at plan view of the property um, by the CNG station, which is diagonal from the service center across the loop. Um, so what you're seeing on this on the left is the admin building and a parking lot. And on the right of that layout is a recycling transfer station and an attached maintenance building along with the parking areas for the trucks. We settled on a floor plan for the building A expansion. And there's, if Alan is squinting at this, he's not gonna see one update on there, which has to do with his, with his folks presence in the building, but this was prepared for, for a couple of weeks ago. So that has been updated, no fear there, Alan. Uh, the mobility master plan, we settled on the consultant. And so that is going to get kicked off very soon. Solid waste division, um, you're looking at a couple of inset photos. That's basically represents what we're trying to well, achieve, but really avoid. Um, we're trying to, trying to recycle and divert some materials from the landfill as well as uh, avoid putting some hazardous materials in the landfill. So this year's collection event, 621 cars, one of which was the mayor, I hear. That's a new record for participation. And it also collected 26 tons of tires. That is also a new record. And I think this is the the slides that Bryn was really looking forward to. So I'm gonna just give you a few seconds, see if you can guess what these numbers represent. I mean, there's a clue in the upper right. Anybody, mayor? Yes, 122,606 miles, the number of miles driven by solid waste trucks this year. Uh, that is actually the quarter. So wow. that, uh, so you got it right, but that's for October, November, and December. Wow. Close, but no prize. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be almost five times around the earth and a little over halfway to the moon. So if we go at that rate for the year, then that's to the moon and back a couple of times. So next quarter, solid waste uh, would like to add a collection route and wrap up their solid waste master plan and present it to you. Uh, an ordinance update for them. We mentioned that fleet is continuing to work on getting some more vehicles in service. Would like to make the uh, traffic signal at the loop in South 31st Street smart. Add detection to that, as well as the uh, big interchange on I-35 west of downtown. Um, and the last bullet, we have kind of need to update a position and make it a little more competitive and um, kind of improve our, our staffing rates in uh, some of our skilled equipment operator positions. Construction projects where you will see activity if you're not starting to see it already, the uh, utility relocation phase of the franchise utilities on Kegley Road phase two. Charter Oak water line is gonna get started. That's the last phase of that water line transmission project. And the membrane plant expansion, that's uh, the one that we mentioned earlier. Um, pretty big project to get kicked off. 
So a lot this quarter and then even more later in the summer. So engineering is very busy delivering capital improvements for us. And I believe that is my last slide. I'll be happy to take any questions. Don, who's going to move the gas lines on Kegel? Uh, that is uh, Atmos's responsibility. I do not know what particular contractor um, they're going to use. Okay. They've indicated that they should start in the next two to three weeks. Finally. You'll believe it when you see it. I will believe it when I see it. All the other, the positive news is I believe all the other franchise utilities have already done their relocation. So once that is done, construction of phase two of Kegley can start. And that, and the utility relocations will be for the entire two, three, and four phase. So once so the second phase is done, there'll be no need to wait on any relocations and we can get started right away on construction phase for uh, phase three and four which is currently planned to go together. And another very recent development that was not on this slide for the last council meeting, but um, you're gonna very soon see some trees getting cleared on Poison Oak Road. And that is gonna, gonna be done to support franchise utility relocations. There's no more questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Don. Hey, we'll uh, now move on to item number five, which is uh, to discuss the corporate. I'm sorry, Stacy. <laughs> the last slide. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> that was easy. No, no, no. I, was, I did that on purpose. <laughs> you were testing me? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here this afternoon. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council, um, for the opportunity to present a departmental update for Performance Excellence. Um, I think the last time I did this was just shortly before you all adopted the strategic plan. And at that point, um, performance excellence was a department of one. So it was just me. Um, so I want to introduce you um, to the staff that the very talented people that um, I've been really fortunate to have come work alongside me. Um, first of all, we have Andrea Ortiz, who is um, the administrative assistant for performance excellence. Um, you've probably seen her. She also mans um, the entry booth um, in City Hall. Um, in addition to her um, administrative duties for performance excellence, she also works on special projects, um, most specifically related to um, smart sheets. And then we have Christine Leal, who is the performance and analytics manager. And um, Christine is probably one of the most talented people that I've had the opportunity to work with. Um, and a, a lot of the results and the progress that I'm gonna show you here in a few minutes related to our strategic plan, the reporting and tracking our key performance indicators is due in very large part to her um, talent, her hard work and her dedication. Um, and then finally we have Craig Flores, who is our safety champion. And Craig is probably one of the nicest guys you'll meet. He almost always has a smile on his face. Um, and along with that really positive attitude, he brings a wealth of safety experience and knowledge to our organization. And pretty much from day one, he um, you know, got on the ball and really began developing our comprehensive safety program. So that's who we are. Now for what we do. Um, performance excellence essentially has three main focus areas. We um, are focused on performance and analytics, organizational development, and diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is new for us, you'll remember. Um, performance and analytics are things like um, our strategic planning, the tracking and the reporting of our strategic plan progress. Also data analysis and reporting. So that's 
our key performance indicators, that's that um, data transparency um, with the dashboards and things that we'll be creating that really um, uh, report our operational results, both um, outward to council and to the public, but also um, internally for us to use as well. Um, along with that is innovation, which is really looking at best practices and also looking at um, ways that we can incorporate um, lean methodologies to do what we do better. And then finally, for, for performance and analytics, awards and recognition and accreditation. And really we um, serve a support role for departments related to those things. And then um, organizational development is employee safety, employee engagement, performance management and customer service. And then finally for diversity, equity and inclusion, that's really, um, you know, we're developing that program, um, getting it off the ground. And it's, it's things like awareness and education, community engagement, um, again, analytics will be important there, action planning, and then support to the newly developed commission. So looking at our 90-day um, results for performance and analytics, um, first, as it relates to the strategic plan, we have um, worked really hard to develop an annual performance report that um, we'll be presenting to count, council in an upcoming um, meeting, and I'm really excited about that. And really what that um, performance report is going to do is report back to you on the progress that we've made um, by focus area in the strategic plan, but also, again, those operational uh, results based on our key performance indicators that departments have worked really hard to develop with us. Um, also, um, we worked on updating um, the strategic plan for FY21, and much like I think Tracy would say for her staff, and the budget is really a um, year-long um, pro process. It's not, it's not really a defined um, time period anymore. It really takes the whole year. It's kind of like what the strategic plan does. We're constantly monitoring and, and, and evolving and refining that. And so that's, that's really some of the accomplishments we've made related to the strategic plan. Um, something that's been interesting, if you'll remember, I think I presented this um, before to council is about Smartsheet, and that's that collaborative work management tool that we implemented back in the fall. And one of the really great um, results that we've seen is departments have really just embraced Smartsheet. And so what's interesting now is departments are looking for creative ways to use Smartsheet. I think Smartsheet's sort of bread and butter is project management, but it's so much more than that. And so departments are really looking for creative ways to um, find efficiencies in their own operations. And so one of those things we've done is we've collaborated with planning and development on um, utilizing Smartsheet to track the comprehensive plan. And then um, we have continued to support the approval request process. This is a really good example of um, some of the power of Smartsheet. So the approval request process is something that we've done internally. A good example of something that would go through this process would be if a department wanted to request a new program um, or a department wanted to request to reclassify a position. In, in, in the past, what we did, there was a paper form that went through different approval process before it gets to the city manager for approval. So what we did is we created an online process through Smartsheet where there's a form that's electronic, people can submit it, department heads can submit it, and it goes through that defined approval process. It's all electronic. Some of the great things about that is that you can look at any time and see where it is in that process. So it's really created efficiencies there. We also want to mention on that, um, a lot of the um, processes that go through that new system didn't even have paper form processes. It would be something you know that I would get in my inbox asking me to make a decision. Um, and we didn't really have a good way to make sure that I had um, the input from any department that would be impacted and the financial analysis done uh, before I decided um, you know, what, the, uh, what should be done with that particular request. So that has been um, really helpful um, this past year. Um, and then another thing that we've worked on um, sort of related to internal support is we began developing uh, a global organization plan for smart team. Like I said, it's really um, sort of taken off like um, a wildfire 
And it's much like, um, this will make Alan cringe, but it's much like if somebody had on your computer dashboard, you had hundreds of files that you're saving on your desktop. Sorry, I said dashboard, but on your desktop, right? There's no, no organization plan. So when you go to look for something, you're you know, hunting and packing and trying to find it. It's much like that. Um, or it could become like that in Smartsheet. And so some of the power of Smartsheet is that you can create dashboards. And so we can create a, a command center of sorts for Bryn so that if she wants to look at um, the status of something in the strategic plan, there's one button that she pushes and it takes her to the right Smartsheet. Or if she wants to look at that approval request process, there's one you know area she goes to on her dashboard and it takes her right to that link. So it's really a way, again, to build efficiencies in what we're doing. That capital um, report that John just showed you in a smart sheet dashboard. Yeah. Kind of what it can look like. And then finally, for performance and, and analytics, um, our key performance indicators. And we worked really hard, as I said a few minutes ago, to collaborate with departments. Departments have worked really hard on this to identify um, operational measures that would report on um, our progress or our results. And so um, that's something else that we worked um, with departments on, and, and I'm, I'm really excited to present that to you guys. Looking at our progress um, for organizational development, um, for performance management, um, so that is really bigger than just um, your annual review. It's not just about um, reviewing performance. It's about um, developing your employees. It's about engaging your employees. So it's a, it's a much larger thing. We had a cross-departmental team that came together um, really over the summer and they worked on a process that would do all of the things that we wanted to do, develop, retain, engage our employees, those kinds of things. Um, and we selected a tool. And so um, that was some really great progress. Um, training and development. We've had a lot of people um, working with our new, with implementing our new human resource information system. I know Alan has, um, his staff has been a lot of staff hours, Tracy's as well, um, and then also Tara with HR. Um, they've worked really hard to implement the, this new human resource information system. Performance Excellence had a piece of that, which was the learning management module. So that we've implemented it, that will be going live um, pretty soon. Um, and so, like I said, that's going to be a really great addition. It's going to give us options for a lot more options for um, ways to track and report on the amount of learning, types of learning and different things that our employees are doing. It's also going to, I think, give them um, better options for um, type, different types of training and learning that they'll be able to do online. Um, we also worked on developing um, a board member toolkit and orientation program. And then as it relates to employee engagement, I will say that COVID has really made employee engagement difficult um, because a lot of the activities and functions that we would normally have done, we haven't been able to do. Um, one of those things was, you know, we weren't able to have our annual Christmas party. So we came up with an idea, which, is a, which was a Christmas giveaway. And so all employees, um, active city employees' names went into a drawing and we were able to give away 70, um, prizes out to employees. So it was something fun that we were still able, able to, you know, recognize and sort of celebrate Christmas with our staff. Um, but, you know, it, like I said, COVID kind of impacted what we normally would have done. And you also had an ugly Christmas we did mask have, contest, yes. which was we interesting. Did. Well, and that was really fun. People really got into it. So I was excited about that. I forgot about that part, right? Um, part of organizational development is our safety program. And I really wanted to call this out a little bit and give you some information about the really great work that has been done by Craig on our um, developing our comprehensive safety program. So he has created a um, safety data sheet library. We are required to um, have safety data sheets on any chemical that's used in the city. And so if you're not familiar with what those are, they tell you um, all about the chemical, the, you know, the they tell you about how to safely use it. They tell you about what um, PPE to use and um, all of that kind of stuff. Well, we're required to have that available. So we've created um, an, an electronic database so it can be accessible. Um, safety training, we've created a library of safety training um, along with an annual training calendar as a resource for departments. We've also developed safety policy and procedure manuals. 
And then as it relates to safety engagement, um, we've developed something, um, we've developed a safety ambassador program, which will really um, be the eyes and ears at the department level um, for safety. So we'll be department representatives that um, are chosen to um, be the department um, go-to for safety. So that's another program that's going to be implemented shortly. And then safety analytics. I think one of the things that you'll kind of hear from me is that data and analytics and and all of this, those are really important and critical to what we do in performance excellence. And they, that kind of flows through through all of those focus areas. Data is, is um, very critical to all of that. And so that's no different in, in our safety program. And so we've developed some standard reports and have been um, reporting those back to the safety committee. So the newly created diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so. If you'll remember when um, Aaron presented the proposal for this commission, included with that was um, a proposal for a staff member to help manage this program and also provide support to count to that uh, commission. And so we created a job description. We have begun the search for the equity manager and um, also the board member search process has begun. So we're moving on that. Now looking at our 90-day um, outlook, what we expect to accomplish in the next 90 days, um, for performance and analytics, we're looking to complete the work on those performance dashboards I talked about. Again, begin working on any updates for um, fiscal year 22 related to the strategic plan. We'll continue our monthly and quarterly reporting on the strategic plan progress. And then again, we'll finalize that um, global organization plan for Smart Chief that I talked about. For organizational development, we'll be looking to implement that performance management tool I talked about. We'll begin rolling out that safety program. Um, we'll implement the boards and commissions orientation program. And then we'll be working with departments on awards and recognition programs for FY21. For diversity and equity and inclusion, um, we'll be looking to hire the equity manager to begin work on the equity indicator report and then begin working with the commission once they're established um, and to develop a community engagement plan. Ms. Hoffman. Yes. Sir. The, uh, the application process for the equity manager just recently closed. Uh, yes. We actually, Aaron and I actually have a call tomorrow with um, SGR and we'll be um, reviewing the um, uh, qualified applicants for that position. Do we know about how many qualified applicants we have? We spoke to her about it. We did one. I think there were five, but she had had a lot of um, other people interested. And so we decided to keep it open for another week. Um, and so we're hoping that we'll have a, she will have gotten um, a, good, a good many more. Okay, good. See. Um, so for performance excellence, we have, I'm, share, I'm going to share with you today two of our key performance indicators that are relating to safety. And this first one, is the total recordable injury rate. And um, so let me explain it a little bit. There's a lot of information there. Um, OSHA defines a recordable injury as anything that um, the employee has to seek medical treatment for and or causes the employee to lose time, so to be away from work. Um, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics publishes this kind of information by, and they categorize it by industry, and then also by um, uh, agency size. And so we are able to use that information to benchmark ourselves. And so what I wanna point out here, although, uh, so the, um, the blue bars represent the total recordable cases. So from 2016 to 2020, the red line at the top represents our total recordable injury rate. And the things that make up that rate are the number of um, recordable injuries. And there's a, there's a conversion factor, much like what we do when we look at the um, property tax rate and we look at that based on uh, per hundred dollar valuation. It does the same kind of thing to convert it essentially so that we're looking at the, you know, the same thing across all organizations and it's looking at um, a, per hundred employees working 40 hours a week. So there's a conversion factor. But the other thing it, um, that is part of that rate is um, total annual hours worked. And so you'll see that um, in 2020, we're at 8.83. The industry average is at 5.6. So we have some work to do there. 
But what I want to what I want to highlight is we have a um, steady downward trend in the number of recordable cases. So if you look in 2016, we had 106, and in 2020 we're down to seven. So we are definitely moving in the right direction. So this next measure is the days away restricted in transferred rate, and um, this is actually a, it's a sort of a drill down on the earlier um, measure because the um, DART is a component of the total recordable injury. Remember I said that it is, it looks at those um, recordable injury as anything that where the employee um, seeks medical treatment and or loses time. So this drills down into that lost time aspect. And what it's really looking at is again, that same, that rate is based on that same sort of calculation. It's looking at the number of, um, incidences that caused, that resulted in lost time, again, with that conversion factor, and then also looking at um, the total annual hours worked. So if you'll look, again, we kind of have that same downward trend. Again, the blue bars represent the hour annual um, number of uh, incidences that reported in loss, that re, um, resulted in lost time. The blue line, I mean, the red line at the top is our dark rate, and then again, that um, dash line is the industry average. So again, you know, it's one of those things where we do have some work to do there, but we are again moving in the right direction. In 2016, we had 16 um, incidences that resulted in lost time, and then in 2020, we're down to 44. So we're definitely make, moving in the right direction. And that's the last thing I had, so I am happy to answer any questions. Who are the most injuries? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can get it for you. I know that generally some of the um, things that some of the um, like back injuries are generally um, some of the most um, common and the highest cost types of injuries that I can. We do have reports on um, by department, um, and I can get some of that information to you if you'd like to. This is, you know how insane it is. This is one of my favorite departments because I know that we, as a council, direct staff through the strategic plan to do a lot of stuff. And then we all, the, the five of us, head back to our, day, our daily lives saying, y'all better go get that done. And the great thing about this department and about um, about uh, city managers' willingness to implement something like this is that they make it trackable and reviewable, and everyone's held accountable. So, um, Stacey, I appreciate the work that you guys do in your apartment and executive staff. I appreciate y'all's willingness to um, just to work on a strategic plan to make that. Uh, something that's always at the forefront and then to, to set up a process to track the progress. Because it's a big organization, they have to be accountable. And I appreciate y'all's willingness and your hard work toward doing that well. I really do. Okay, moving on to um, item number five is uh, to discuss the corporate hangar phase four. And um, this uh, item will be held in executive session so, um, any uh, one that's not absolutely pertinent to this conversation, to please exit the room, including Councilor Lee. Yes. Can we read it in? Okay. Uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.087, Council may meet this closed session in closed session to hold us on the right to work on all financial information received by the business prospect that the governmental body seeks to have locate, stay, or expand in and near the city of Temple, and with which the governmental body is conducting economic development negotiations in order to deliberate an offer of a financial or other such a business property. I said that at 4 10. 4 10 